Welcome to Outdoor Education. My name is Dave Connolly, and I'm one of the coordinators here for our sixth grade program that all sixth graders at 12 Corners Middle School will participate in. This requires the students to have all kinds of cooperation and teamwork. Two of our major themes here at Outdoor Education. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the kids in small groups of 10 to 12, and we're going to put them through different activities in which they'll be forced to cooperate with one another and work on solving a common task. I'm going to take a little time on this beautiful morning and walk you around our Challenger course at camp. Let me show you the different tasks that we'll put the kids up to. We like to start the kids out with a task that's a little easier than some of the other ones that we're going to do. This is a simple log balance, very simple activity. The students will grab hands and they will form a line in which we'll ask them all to step onto the log, move their way across, and stay connected. It's a nice beginning event, it's a nice beginning challenge because they have a high success rate at it. Once everybody gets on the log, you can do things like left leg only, right leg only, hands in the air, whatever you would like to do. It's a lot of fun and it's a good way to start the different challenge activities. Now we like to take the students to a challenge that's a little bit more difficult. This is such a popular event for us, it's developed its own name. This is Alligator Alley. The object would be the 10 to 12 students will line up behind this stump and we have a rope connected to a very strong cable, very safe. Students step on the log and they have to swing in the air and land on one of the other stumps without touching the ground. As we start to get more students swinging their way over to the new stumps, they have to help each other with uh, offering a hand, offering balance, offering support. And the objective here is to see, can we place all dozen students on one of the logs without anybody falling off? A lot of fun. The next event, the next challenge, we call Lifesaver because I'm looking through the middle of a lifesaver. All the students will start on one side of the tire. They will form a line. We'll give them some time to develop a strategy. And the objective here would be to get all students through the tire to the other side. This task is gonna require the students to have a strategy and approach it in a kind of a group mentality. What's gonna be needed here is for them to figure out what is the best order in which all students will put themselves through the tire. This creates a situation where the students have to talk to each other. They have to strategize because eventually what will happen is there will be only one person left on the side and they'll have to figure a way of getting that person through the tire as well. This session turns out to be a fantastic team building challenge for the groups. Our next event or our next challenge is a task that has earned its own name over time. This is referred to as Save the Baby. Let me explain why. Groups will stand on the podium. They will place groups on the panel. One person is deemed the baby. They are helpless. They can't help pull. They can't even talk. They can only babble. The other people are responsible for getting our cart all the way up a slight slope without tipping and falling off reaching the bell where the baby and then back goes our cart. When the group arrives back at the landing, four jump off, four jump on, and there's a new baby that needs to be transported and brought back. We time the groups and we see who's the most efficient with their time. Again, students are required to make a strategy break their groups into smaller groups that make sense. It, again, forces them to work cooperatively together in groups. Our next activity, like all of the others at Challenge Course, requires our students to work in their small group cooperatively to accomplish a task. This task is a little bit more physical and demanding. Where we had Alligator Alley before, we are now at Crocodile Crossing. The group will be split into two groups. One will start behind a tree over here, and this rope will be given to this area. The other half of the group will begin at this tree, and this rope will be given to them. The object is to have everybody from that side walk the cable 
and return to that side. And everybody from over here walked the cable to that tree and that back down to that line. What will eventually happen is the students will need to strategize and figure out what is the best way to use these ropes. Once on the cable, they're on their own and they have to pass each other's trails. Our next activity, referred to as the human web, is often used as a culminating event. It's probably best used at the end of the session time when the students are the most familiar with working with each other, bracing each other, supporting each other, and working together in groups. This is a very complicated activity and it takes a number of adults and staff members to spot students. What they will do is everybody will start on this side of the web and of course there are different openings and pockets that exist in the web. The rules are everybody needs to pass through one of the gaps and you cannot touch any of the string. Students may support each other, they may help each other, they may guide each other through, or in some cases, they may just step through. Once a student has gone through a gap, that gap becomes closed to any other students that want to follow. During this event, we hope that the students are at a point in their group where cooperation is going at a higher level. They're actually thinking two or three steps ahead as a group to find out who would be best going through each gap. Very difficult for groups to get all 12 students across because it's very difficult to have them all take different gaps. Working cooperatively, working together as a team, they start to figure out that different gaps might be more ideal for different students and it might be more ideal for the order to change according to student. Very challenging event um, and groups have different levels of success, obviously. Hello and welcome to Outdoor Ed Fishing. I'm Craig Dennison, teacher at 12 Corners Middle School and glad to share with you the beauty and how we make Outdoor Ed Fishing run. First we talk, we bring the kids in and we like to show them what's in the pond. We tell them that this is called fishing, not catching, but there may be some catching. And we talk about fish anatomy for a little bit. I've got a friendly little largemouth bass in here that one of the kids caught in the last session. And so I will tell the kids how to wet my hands first, how to hold a fish. You can zoom in. We talk about the anatomy of the fish a little bit, how it's got dark olive back, it's got a lateral line for hearing, it's got the mouth, the cartilage, large mouth, it's got an underbelly, how it camouflages, blends in, what it likes to eat. So I'm gonna let this guy go, gently. So we talk about the sunfish that we might catch and their spines and their coloration. We talk about the largemouth bass. And then we have the kids next pick up rods and practice casting. Many of our kids have never cast a rod before. These are simple closed faced rods. They have a eight or 10 barbed mustad hook with a snap swivel. They also have a bobber about two and a half to three feet up from the bottom of the hook. So we tend to find that smaller bobbers work better and smaller hooks are a little better with the sunfish as well as the bass. We demonstrate safety, how to hold it when you walk. And so you'll notice that I've got my hands safely um, touching or holding the, the barb or holding the hook and away from me. I'm not hitting anybody. And we'll come over to here or some spot and we'll just have the kids practice casting. We'll tell them to keep the rod up, click it, depress it with your thumb and just lob it forward. A lot of kids want to go 30, 40, 50 feet out. Most fish are caught within five to 10 feet of this whole island. And so after a kid has practiced five, six, seven, eight, cast successfully and not tangled, and they, they're aware that you know the tip's not tangled and they're walking safely, we bring them over to the bait station. And we talk about how to hook a worm or how to hook a minnow. And so then the kids get a little excited because a lot of them have not touched worms or minnows before. It's really important that we model it once or twice and then this hands off. Let the kids get comfortable touching the worms, putting their hands into the dirt, into the worm bucket, into the big bait bucket with all the minnows. Let them get comfortable doing that and experience success. If we do it for them, they become more dependent upon us. This is about empowering them, allowing them to really have that valuable experience of doing it themselves, baiting their own hook, casting themselves, and just learning a little bit through trial and error. 
usually for the big night crawler, I'll put it into three different pieces, proportions, so that, it, and, and put it, hook at least three times on a hook. So a worm you want to have hooked at least three times so it doesn't come off easily. Minnows, we try to hook them between the eyes or through the lid. These are just common fathead minnows. Kind of hold it fairly tight. I'm going to just run that hook point right between the eyes. And then you've got your fathead minnow. And then we go over to a spot and I tell the kids just make a 5, 10, 15 foot cast and put the rod down. Put the rod down. Set it. Set it down. Don't touch it. And be patient. Wait for that bobber to go under. To go all the way under and start swimming away from you or away and then real hard. And then usually we help the kids land the fish. There are some nets available if you want. It's awesome to see after 55 minutes a kid who wouldn't touch a worm, wouldn't put a minnow on a hook, is all of a sudden confidently doing that or they're catching their first fish or their they're, they're, they're joys, you know, yelling with excitement as they're reeling on a fish. I got a fish, I got a fish. It's really gratifying. And then we kind of wrap it up. We'll put a couple of fish in our fish bucket, hopefully sunfish, a perch, or a largemouth bass. We talk a little bit more about, you know, what they eat here. Or they eat the leeches, crayfish, they eat cannibalized other fish, they eat polywogs, they eat the salamanders, they eat the damselflies, dragonflies. How it's kind of a, a, a food buffet of opportunities. Eat or be eaten in this environment. We also talk a little bit about the painted box turtles, the snapping turtles. Each session's a little bit different and they just experience a lot of success and fun and, and get a better experience with fishing. Thanks and uh, thanks for supporting this awesome event. Hello, my name is Rob Thomas and I'm one of the orienteering instructors here at Outdoor Education. Orienteering is one of eight activity sessions that the kids rotate through over the course of their two days. Everything we need to know about orienteering is in this handy notebook along with this video. Orienteering is a fun way for the kids to learn how to use a compass and also be encouraged to work cooperatively with a friend as they measure their distance and find directions using this on the beautiful fields behind me at the Rotary Sunshine Campus. Students are challenged at three different levels. Green for easy, yellow for medium, and red for hard as they try to find their points, measure their distances, and arrive at the correct destination. Students have a lot of success with these cards as they work together with the staff and one another. A giant orienteering compass is used to show the students the parts of the compass and how to use it as they're finding their own directions through the woods. Using orienteering and using a compass, students not only are cooperating and working together to problem solve, they're using mathematics skills and science skills to find their points and understand how a compass works. We hope that the students enjoy orienteering, learn how to use a compass, understand some of the principles behind the magnetic forces that the Earth has, use mathematical skills to help them estimate distance and direction. They're using cooperative skills where they work with a partner, having a greater appreciation for the outer doors, and hopefully sparking interest in some students to pursue other opportunities in orienteering through camping and competitive courses in and around the Monroe County area. Of all eight sessions, students tell me repeatedly that this is one of their top eight favorite sessions. I'm Steve Leon. I teach sixth grade math. With Project Adventure, we have a series of team building activities, basically problem solving activities for the kids to work on in groups. Um, it requires both verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, there's some physical tasks, but mostly mental, um, and it's a good chance to challenge themselves and see if they're able to successfully complete these activities. So the Toxic Waste Challenge, we present it as such. There's a rope boundary and you put the bucket in the middle. The bucket's filled about three quarters of the way full with water. The first thing we'll do is tell them about not touching the rope and that anything inside the rope is considered you know, a toxic waste zone. So anything that touches in, they lose the use of. So if their foot accidentally touches inside, we make them stand on one leg for the remainder of the activity. If their arm touches, they lose the use of that arm. If both feet touch and they, they land in there, then that person is basically out for the rest of the activity. That usually doesn't happen. We tell them, we kind of go through, and I kind of let them talk through and struggle. Well, how are we going to get this? We can't reach it. And then at the last minute, you kind of let them know that the, there is one material that they get to use, and that's a rubber tubing that has string tied all the way around it. Pretty quickly, most groups realize that if they grab the string, they pull, the tubing expands, and they can latch it onto the bucket. And once they get the bucket out of the containment unit without spilling, you place another bucket inside, and they have to pour the water into it without spilling any of it. That's where it becomes a little bit tricky, and 
most of the time groups will say, okay, let's just go there, you hold one end high, I'll hold the other end low, and they realize that only tips the bucket about that much. So then they have to figure out, well, what are they gonna do to actually pour it out? Some try to attach it to the lip of the bucket and try to tip it. Usually all groups are very successful in figuring out how to pour some of the water in, and then getting the remaining bit, that's where it becomes that real challenge and how to communicate it and how to figure that out. I'd say most groups are successful with that. If not, by the end of 20 minutes, I kind of give them a hint, try to guide them along the way so at the very end, at least everybody has an idea of how to do it. Then I always like to do the simple, what I think is the most simple one next, which is the human knot. So most have all had experience with that. They line up in a circle, they face each other, have them put their right arm out, hold hands with somebody that is not directly next to you, put their left hand out, have to hold hands with a different person, but also not somebody directly next to you. Once we get that, I'll let them know that they can adjust their grips if they need to, as long as they don't let go of each other's hands. And then slowly they try to unknot themselves so they're standing in a circle. Sometimes it ends up being two circles, depending on who they're holding hands with. It's also fun because, again, being sixth graders, getting in close physical proximity with each other has that share of awkwardness. But because they're going to be spending time in all these groups all the entire session, it's a nice kind of icebreaker activity to get them comfortable with each other. The last challenge, which is actually the most difficult, and I've rarely seen anybody successfully complete it, is they have to, without speaking, and we limit the ways they can communicate, line themselves up in a birthday order from January to December. It's very eye-opening for a teacher to kind of see kids that are able to non-verbally communicate versus the ones that rely on having their voice heard all the time. These activities are great because it helps them build um, communication skills with each other. It helps them develop the ability to take risks. Some, some kids are more really outgoing and they realize quickly if they're just trying to talk over everyone, they're not really successful either. So it kind of pushes them out of their comfort zone. The people that are used to leading sometimes have no choice but to take a step back. The people that like to take a step back and just sit out really realize they, their group can't be successful if they do that. So it's a really safe, kind of fun way for people to get pushed out of their comfort zone a little bit and work together. Project Adventure has always been a personal favorite of mine to run and, and I really enjoy doing this with the kids. I am Sarah Fisher. I am one of the band teachers at 12 Quarters Middle School. I Spy is basically a scavenger hunt or the I Spy with my little eye game for the kids to get to know the campus and to also kind of pay attention to little details that they might be missing, like different plants and foliage. They get to go explore for roughly 30, 35 minutes on their own. Every student gets a list, every student gets a dry erase marker, and they go out in groups of two or three to look for these items. Different plants and flowers. There's also some exciting things like different kinds of tree bark. They also get digital cameras. So rather than picking the flower or picking the leaf, they go around and when they find these items, they take a picture of it. The cameras are kind of cool. We've had fun showing the kids how to use the cameras. To them, these digital cameras are so old. This session is really nice for students to just kind of focus in on the nature around them. Um, they don't have a lot of like hard physical work to do. They can actually just appreciate being outdoors and getting to see um, things around them. Then they come back here, we tally up the points. We had to talk about where they found things, what they found. We kind of have a point system for this. Like they get extra bonus points if they find a picture of a live critter. And then if they find trash along the way, they get the most points if they bring back trash or put it in a trash bag. What I find to be really incredible is uh, students who maybe don't take a lot of time to focus. They just see a tree, oh, it's a tree. But here they actually have to find the leaves and look at the different shapes and then match it up. This is especially nice for students to get acclimated with the area and feel more right at home. My name is Chris Montulli. I'm an eighth grade social studies teacher at TCMS. We're out here on the archery range at Outdoor Ed. I've been running the archery range here at Outdoor Ed for a number of years. I shoot archery myself, so I enjoy coming out here with the kids uh, and it gives me an opportunity to interact with them and to shoot my own bow. And so archery, we go through a safety briefing with the kids and show the kids you know, a safe way to use the bow. There's a couple different bows that they can use. They can use recurve bows and compound bows. Recurve bows, pretty straightforward, traditional archery. When you pull this bow back, you're holding the whole weight of the bow at full draw and so forth, but right and left-handed usually can shoot recurve bow. Um, compound bows are a little bit different. These are set up just for either shooting right-handed or shooting left-handed. Um, and when you pull these back, you can tell by the cams and, and pulleys here, when you pull these back, there's a big let off at the end, so you pull it back all the way, 
and then you can hold it at full draw for a little bit longer and be a little more accurate with it. And so we run through a little safety briefing with the kids, show them some technique, the proper technique, knocking the arrow, how to knock an arrow properly and safely and making sure that that odd colored fletching is facing away from the bow, making sure that arrow is pointed downrange, repeating that same procedure over and over and over again so you can be more accurate, and then get the kids up here for uh, at a time shooting about six or seven arrows uh, each time that they shoot. Then they go and retrieve their arrows and come back and run through uh, all the groups that way. Archery, what I've noticed uh, with the kids, what it helps the, the kids with, um, there's a lot of dexterity. There's a lot of fine motor skills. And once the kids start getting that down, they get that confidence and stuff. You should see their faces when they hit that bullseye for the first time. It's a great experience for the kids out here. Archery is one of the sessions that is really unique to outdoor ed. You're not gonna get this experience in the classroom at TCMS. Uh, you're only gonna get this here at Outdoor Ed. Hi there, I'm Kathleen Oster. I teach seventh grade health and I'm also a PE teacher at the middle school. Today we're here at Firestarter, one of the best stations in my opinion. The kids do a lot of hands-on activities, starting a fire, and then at the end they get to boil water and make hot chocolate so they get a nice sense of uh, accomplishment here. First thing we do is we have them gather around our area and we talk about why do we need fire, what's the purpose of fire. So if we're camping, if we're doing something where we need fire, what is the purpose? So number one, to make sure that we boil water and make sure it's clean water so we boil all the bacteria out. Number two, we might need to cook with it or we might need to keep warm from a fire. And then we uh, talk about some safety concerns. So the first thing they do is they set their water balls down and they put their uh, ID tags down and then we talk about when you're creating a fire, you also have to remember that someone should always make sure they're attending the fire so when other people are gathering the wood there's always should be one person tending to the fire making sure that the fire is safe and then we go into our process of how to build the fire so the task that they would need to follow is number one they have to get the middle sized pieces of wood that will um, enable them to have a sort of a log cabin base and that will be able to be the base of the fire and then they need the small little pieces of kindling. Then they need to also find a few rocks of decent size to help contain the fire. And then also when the process is ready for them to put the grate over the fire, they put the grate over the rocks to make their boiling water. So we go over the steps on how to make a proper fire. And one of the things is to make sure that they spread out the kindling and we talk about what does fire need. The fire needs air, the fire needs oxygen, the fire needs some sort of spark to get started. So we teach them the proper way to light a match because some of them actually never even used a match before so it's an important life skill. So making sure that they're lighting the match close to the fire and they're lighting the match away from their body and then they all get a chance to practice that. Once they start the fire, they keep adding pieces of wood to it and then eventually have something there that they've found fairly exciting and they have accomplished something. And then we add the grates and the boiling water is next and then they make their hot chocolate. Once they boil the water and everything's finished, it's time to put the fire out, make sure that everything is safe and make sure that no fire is going to be spreading anywhere else. So what they need to be doing, being aware that the rocks are very hot, take a large stick, make sure they move the rocks away from the fire, spread the pieces of wood out, and if they need to, also add some dirt, make sure the fire is completely out with no hot embers, and make sure that we put it out safely. So I love Firestarter because it's hands-on activities. The kids generate a lot of uh, sense of accomplishment and camaraderie through the activities, and just another great thing about ODE. I'm Melissa Sartain, I'm one of the art teachers. We're here today at Outdoor Ed and we're going to learn how to make a macrame bracelet. I'm going to show the students how to make a spiral knot and flat knots and how to do beading. So to get started to prepare for all these, you need two pieces of hemp or you could use cotton string if you wanted. Yarn's not so good because it'll fray. You need two pieces that are 45 inches long so all the materials are prepared for the students before they get here. 
Then the two pieces are hemp of 45 inch hemp are put together. And then at 12 inches, we pull the hemp over and we make a little slip knot. And that's sort of our clasp for our bracelet. Then we use a little clipboard and to get started, you take your two short pieces of hemp and we secure those in the middle with a piece of tape. And these are the pieces that you're just gonna be tying your square knots around. So what we start with the students is showing them how to do it with the letter P. And then we lay the cord over that and we come through the center where we grab all three of these. And as we keep doing this particular knot, it will do a spiral. And this particular function that we do at Outdoor Ed, it's the only sort of thing where we kind of sit down, relax. It's not as active as the other things. It gives the students the time to kind of just do something a little different than the ropes or the other things that are more active. So as I keep doing this particular knot, my hemp will start to spin just slowly. Now the kids get a chance to decide if they'd like to put a bead on their project. That's an option if they'd like to do it. At this point, I can put on a bead, and the only and the way I do it is I just release these cords in the middle. I slide on a wood bead, and then I just go back to my same knot. Now, to make the hemp so it's flat, like some of the paracord braces are, I can do a um, knot like that. I go back to my doing my P. And then my other knot would be like the number four. And when you do this knot on every other turn time, it will make it flat. Then I do my, my back to my P. And then a four. All right, and that will make the hemp flat. Okay. All right, so now I have um, a bracelet that's almost finished. Actually, this was made by one of our parents, which was really nice of them to come and, and help at Outdoor Ed. And to finish it off, at this point I've done a spiral knots, I've added a bead, and then at the end, all we do is we can take it to, together as a group. Make a knot, do that, and then it will, this is gonna be a little small for me, but then this is your clasp that you have kind of left in uh, your hemp, and then you would just pull these particular cords through and tie a knot, and then it would be all finished as a hemp bracelet. Outdoor Ed's a lot of fun. I've done it for a few years now and I love coming out here. I think it's a wonderful opportunity that the kids in this district have the chance to do. This is a simple log balance. Simple log balance. Simple log balance. Simple log balance. To step onto the log, move their way across, left leg only, right leg only, hands in the air, whatever you would like to do. This is a simple log balance, simple log balance, simple log balance, left leg only, right leg only, left leg only, right leg only, left leg only, right leg only, hands in the air, whatever you would like to do. This is a simple log balance, simple log balance, simple log balance. This is a simple log balance, simple log balance, simple log balance. To step onto the log, move their way across. Left leg only, right leg only, left leg only, right leg only, left leg only, right leg only. Hands in the air, whatever you would like to do. Left leg only, right leg only, left leg only, right leg only, left leg only, right leg only. Hands in the air, whatever you would like to do.